Your desire to unite us through Lord in mind and heart and our will and all our ways. I pray, dear Lord, for your presence among us. I pray, dear Lord, for your words to be spoken and for you to work in our hearts, dear Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, to receive the gifts we've been given with grace and gratitude. And I pray, dear Lord, that because of the gifts we receive, that you would work a mighty thing in our hearts, that you would purify us and direct our minds and our hearts and our will towards you. In Jesus' precious name, the intercession of the beloved St. Mary and all your saints, hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you had a heavenly, transforming, liturgical experience just a few minutes ago. I hope it was more transformative than the coffee that you're having after the liturgy. And you're like, Mark, come on, this coffee's really good. It's really hard to beat this coffee. And some of you are saying, well, I don't think I've ever had a transforming experience in the liturgy. I mean, I feel the same way every week. I've been feeling the same way for years. It's a thing I do. It's a place I go to on Sundays. I know I'm supposed to go, so I'm here. And communion is supposed to be good. I believe communion is good for me and my kids, so we come. But it's just a routine. Actually, it's not even as much of a routine as it used to be because of the pandemic. And so now we're letting go easier and easier. We have more and more excuses of why we're not coming to church and having communion. It's so sad that we're letting go of communion more and more. There are very common feelings if this is somehow the way you feel, you're not alone. Especially if you've had to take care of kids in the liturgy, the liturgy can be a very frustrating and difficult experience. And I'll be honest, I feel the same way quite often. But I know I shouldn't. None of us should. I don't want us to let go so easily. And what I wish is for us to all hold on to this precious gift more than we ever have before. I wish that the liturgy, the communion, would be the highlight of our week, of our lives. By God's grace, it will be. The Holy Eucharist, known as the Divine Liturgy, is the most important worship experience in the Orthodox Church. The most important worship experience is the liturgy. It's the sacrament of sacraments. All the sacraments of the Church lead towards the liturgy. When you get baptized and chrismated that day, you have communion. If you are ordained, it's so that you could serve communion. If you are sick, what do we do? We pray on you and we bring you communion. And if you're married and the two become one flesh, it's actually a symbol of communion. See, this is the highest part of our worship. For 1900 years, this is what the church had. There were no women's, men's, women's Bible studies or men's groups or nadi or summer clubs or Halloween or Christmas parties. For 1900 years, the church gave us the Eucharist. In the midst of persecution and famines and rough times, the church gave us the Eucharist and that was enough. It was more than enough. It was an abundance for them. The whole life of a Christian before the 1900s, it was revolving around the liturgy. The important day of the week is the liturgy day. And then you fill the rest of your week with other things. But the important day in your life, in your week, in your year, is when you come to have communion. What God gives us in the Eucharist is so much. It's such an incredible gift. I'm going to include some quotes by some, some fathers, which I think you'll find 
hopefully uh, inspiring. It says, there's nothing on earth. Father John of Kronstadt, he was a Russian Orthodox priest in the late 1800s, early 1900s, a miracle worker, an incredible servant, but the liturgy was his thing. He says, there is nothing on earth higher, greater or more holy than the divine liturgy. Nothing more solemn, nothing more life-giving. Meaning of all the things on the earth, of all the things you try, nothing is greater or more holy than the liturgy. And then there's this idea that it is life-giving, it's full of grace. It's a shield against Satan. It's the opening of heaven. It's a very small glimpse of what God is intending for this. I'm going to read you a quote. The Russians, before they became Christians, the emperor sold, uh, told some of his ambassadors, I want you to go out and I want you to go to some of these Christian services. Find out what they're doing. I want you to go and discover and come back and tell me. So the ones who went to Agia Sophia, it's a beautiful cathedral in Constantinople, this is what they said. When they came back, they said, we knew not, when they attended the religion, whether we were in heaven or on earth. For surely there is no such splendor or beauty anywhere on earth. We cannot describe it to you. We only know that God dwells there among men and that their service surpasses the worship of all other places. These were non-Christians who came to a liturgy and said, I think we were in heaven. Wow. That's their experience? So why is it that's their experience, but it's not my experience? Why is there a disconnection between the two? Why is it some are seeing heaven and some of us are wondering when it's going to be over. I'm going to read you a quote. This is a theologian, uh, an amazing theologian, Father Alexander Shmemin, a, a Russian, uh, he, was, he was just an amazing author and he gave us much. He said this, this is about his own experience. He says, for the more real my experience of the Eucharistic liturgy, he said, the more my experience became real, the stronger I had this feeling there's a Eucharistic crisis in the church. He called it a crisis, a Eucharistic crisis in the church. He says, the tradition of the church, nothing has changed. The liturgy, the Eucharist, it's the same. That has not changed. He says, but what has changed is the perception of the Eucharist, the perception of its essence. Essentially, the crisis is a lack of connection between what is accomplished in the Eucharist and what is perceived, understood, and lived. He says the liturgy is amazing as it always has been. But why is there the lack of change in people's lives? It's because our perception is weak. And we are not living it. If only we knew what was going on. Maybe because we don't see something with our physical eyes, our spiritual eyes don't see it either because we don't want to or we don't expect to. We don't think anything is going to happen to us. So we just come and we stand in line, we open our mouth at the right time and we will go through the line and that's it. But it's not like that for so many others. Maybe our understanding of what's going on is too limited. And the problem is, he says, there's a problem in the way that it is lived. You're supposed to live the liturgy? You're supposed to live it? Absolutely. It's not meant to be closed in the church for two and a half hours. The liturgy is supposed to be your life. If we lived the liturgy outside of Sunday morning, our lives would be transformed, but we don't think about that. I remember going to St. Anthony's Monastery in Egypt about 30 years ago, and we got to attend the liturgy. And after the liturgy, the monks disappeared because what they had was a treasure. They didn't want to just sit and talk. They wanted to go and protect and reflect on what they had just received. So I'm praying that in this series for the next couple of weeks, God will change our perspective so that we could see what is going on. Just a glimpse. 
and maybe that our lives would change as a result. So I want to begin with something basic. We call the communion or the liturgy of the Eucharist. What does Eucharist mean? Does anyone know of Eucharistia? Eucharist means thanks. It means thanks. This is the liturgy of giving thanks. We come here to give thanks. Does that make sense? This father said, unspeakably moved by the memory of God's past kindnesses, by the vision of what he now grants, or by all that he holds out as a future reward to those who love him, the mind gives thanks. If you think about all the things that he's done in your past, and the thing that he's doing for you now, and the things that he will do for you, you would give thanks. I want to remind you, about a month ago, we celebrated Thanksgiving. One day a year, right? And maybe on Thanksgiving, it's a holiday, right? You get to be at home. Maybe we spent almost five minutes thanking God. The one day in the year, we spent five minutes thanking God. Let me ask you, has God not done enough that you should give Him thanks? Is there more that He needs to do to prove to you His kindness and mercy? What could He do more for you? What has He not done for you? The actual response is unspeakably moved. The mind gives thanks. It should give thanks. And so when we come to the liturgy, many of us have the spirit of, come on, get in the car, we're going to the liturgy. Maybe our mind should be different. That God gave us so much, that we would not have made it to Sunday without Him. We wouldn't have the house, we wouldn't have the car to get here, we wouldn't have anything. If we would have no God in our lives, we would have nothing. So let us go because He deserves that I should go thank Him in person. Let's go to the church to thank God for all that He's done. What if the night before or the morning of, you just sit and be thankful for all that God has done for you? How are you going to change your mindset when you go to church? You're going to be like, let's go quickly. Because he's done so much, I have to go thank him. That's the liturgy of the Eucharist. And that's what we do. There is this one, I, I found this quote, and this blew me away. He says, If you could see what grace comes down in the liturgy, you would be ready to gather the dust from the floor of the temple and wash your face with it. He says, like, if you saw the glory of what's happening, how the heavens are opened, and the heaven and the earth are united, the angels are filling the sanctuary. We call it the house of angels in the morning praises. This is the house of angels. You may not see it, but they're there. There are people who do see it. And then he says, if you could see the grace where the Holy Spirit is coming down, and the body and blood are now there, if you could see all that, you would say, this is a holy place. And you would take the dust of the earth and wash your face. We don't understand how amazing what goes on. And if you knew that the most amazing thing between heaven and earth happens there on Sunday, how would that change your feeling when you come? So one of the things I was talking about in giving thanks... The liturgy is a reason to give thanks. For what happens in the liturgy, that enough is a, a call to be thankful. And then, you know what you're called as Christians? As Christians, we are called to become Eucharistic. It says in, in 1 Thessalonians, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. How often? In everything give thanks. So in every moment, you should be Eucharistic. What we do here is supposed to flow into our lives throughout the week. Now I'm going to go back to some basics. Um, I want to read this from the Bible. Okay, John chapter 6. If you want to read about communion, read John chapter 6. Uh, it's, it's a number of verses here. But I want us to see what does Jesus Christ feel about what we're doing here. 
He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. He says, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Okay, I want you to remember that. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. It's a bread, that, it's a heavenly bread that comes down from heaven that you may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh. I shall give for the life of the world. And the Jews quarreled and said, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, He's like, Chudubalku, pay attention. I am telling you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have what? You have no life in you. If you don't eat my body, you have no life. What does it mean to have no life? The medical term, someone has no life, we say, they're dead, okay? It's no life. Without this, you're dead. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Now let's say that you had never read this before. That you've never heard about Jesus Christ and you're going to some class and they say, let's read this. This is something that Jesus Christ said. What would you think about what Jesus Christ said about communion? He's very serious about it. He's saying this is so important that if you don't take this, you're dead. But if you have this, you will live forever. Like he's trying to say, and Christ says, most assuredly I say to you, you have to. If you eat my body, you'll be raised. You'll have eternal life. I will live in you forever. Over and over. He says it over and over. This is so important to Jesus Christ. And there were people who left him because they couldn't accept this concept of eating his body, his blood. He says, unless you do. You won't have life. But if you know that you're going to have eternal life by eating the body and drinking the blood, don't you want to come? Don't you want your kids to come as often as possible? Don't you want to, like, absorb life? This is living bread. And it carries with it the power of resurrection. I want you to understand that this body and blood is united to the divine life in heaven. And when the divine life is united to your mortal life, what happens? Resurrection happens. This is resurrection food. Jesus Christ, the only reason why we're Christian, the only reason why we have anything, He's our God. And He felt that strongly about it. And He says, most assuredly I say to you, so then how should we feel about it? that maybe I need to raise it in my level of priority. That the communion is not a drag, it's not boring, it is the greatest thing on the earth. We are having resurrection food. But then you're going to say, wait a minute, I don't always get it. It doesn't make a difference to me. So I was reading this quote, and it's, it's a nice one, and it, and it says, it needs to be received in faith. And you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I know, it's the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But almost like it means nothing to us. Yeah, yeah it's just, it might as well be like, I can't wait to have the Arban after. Well, sometimes we care more about the Arban after or the water being thrown on us more than the communion. I, I know you understand that it's the body and blood of Christ, but is there a faith that this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ? It says, it needs to be an encounter with which the transmission of divine energy can take place. There needs to be an encounter that there is divine energy. So for it to get, it take place, our attitude has to be there. He says, its power is objective and independent of our attitude towards it. He says, there's power in it. Regardless of how you feel, there's power in it. But our attitude can actually change it. He says, our attitude can only encourage or restrict the spread of the Eucharistic fire through our soul and body. We can restrict the power of the fire being spread through our soul and body. And I have a feeling that's likely what's happening for most of us. 
I want to give you an example. There was Christ when he was in Caesarea. He says, I can't do miracles here. Why? Why couldn't he do the miracles there? Was it because he didn't have power? Did he lose his power in Caesarea? No. But because of their lack of faith. He says, I can't do miracles here because of your lack of faith. Maybe we don't have the right understanding or the right attitude towards the Eucharist. So when you go to the Eucharist, you don't expect there to be fire in your soul and your body. You don't expect it to do anything for you. You expect it to be something that you just do. Now, the resurrection on the last day, which we just read about, is incredible. But he says, abiding in him and us, like he will abide in us and we will abide in him. He's saying our lives can be intertwined. I want to read this quote to you. Just as by melting two candles together, you get one piece of wax. So I think one who receives the flesh and blood of Jesus is fused together with him. And the soul finds that he is in Christ and Christ is in him. By St. Cyril of Jerusalem, which is in the early centuries of the church. It's like the two separate candles become one, almost inseparable. Well, what is the goal of the Orthodox Christian? To be united to Christ and to become like Christ. What is a better way of becoming like Christ than to have His body and blood often? And so when you come, do you ask and say, God, I need you to cleanse my mind and make my mind like yours. I want you to change my heart so that my heart would be loving like yours. I want my will to be for the salvation of your children just like yours. When you come, say, Dear God, I want to be so united to you that you are dwelling in me, that my life is yours, and that your life is the one that I'm living. This should be happening, but because of our perception and our attitude towards it as being just baraka. Unfortunately, it's not just baraka. It's not just a blessing. This is Father John of Kronstadt that I was telling you about. This is what he says after he had communion. He says, The Lord is within me personally, purifyingly, blessedly, victory creating, God endowing, miracle working. He says, which I feel within myself. It's not just theory. It can be felt. It's, he was an incredible priest, and he's, they would say, like, he draws life from the source of life eternal. He gets filled with it. And then after being filled with it, he says, the Lord is within me personally, purifying me, blessedly, victory-creating, God-endowing, and miracle working. And he was a miracle worker. And he saw communion as his greatest source of life and power. Now, what I'm going to say is actually very basic, but very deep. And I think you guys know, in our minds, we believe and understand, but has it penetrated our hearts? When we partake of the body and blood of Christ, the historical Jesus is present on the altar. The one who was incarnate. The one who walked on this earth, who did the miracles, who died on the cross, who went into the tomb, and who rose. That same Jesus is the one we part. That same Jesus. But we have very little enthusiasm about it or interest. Now, if I tell you Jesus Christ said he was actually going to come walk in front of the church on this street right here, Fairfield Road, he's coming next Sunday at 10 a.m., he's going to be walking on that road. So what time are you going to be here? Oh, I'm going to be here at least at 8 a.m. You might even spend the night here because I want to see Jesus Christ walking from afar. You know there's going to be a crowd around him. You would wake up and be so excited just to see Jesus Christ in a crowd walking far. It reminds me of the woman who had the hemorrhage for years. She was weak. She was considered defiled. She was anemic. And what did she do? She's like, I'm going to fight through a crowd just so I could do what? What did she want to do? Just touch the hem of his garment. I just want to touch his, not even him. I don't know if I want to touch. I just, I just want to touch his garment. And she fought to touch 
His garment. And I tell you something greater than the garment is here. It's not just watching Him in a crowd. It's Him, the crucified Christ. The body and blood on the cross is there. We're not re-crucifying Him. The, he's not re-crucified and re-sacrificed. We're participating in the original sacrifice. We're with Him in the Last Supper. And something that we'll talk about is, you want to know who is the one who gives us communion? It's not Abuna. It's Christ, the priest, in Abuna, in the Last Supper, giving to us, saying, Take, eat of it, all of you. This is my body and this is my blood. Jesus Christ is giving you communion. Wow. That Jesus Christ, that body and blood are here. And you're like, well, does it really do anything? Many of us, we had a friend at St. John who got a stroke. He was hemiplegic, like half his body was paralyzed. You know what a stroke does? It kills brain, you know, they say time is brain. And he could not move half his body. Then Abuna would go visit him in the hospital and give him communion every week. And every week he could move that side of his body more and more. And now he walks to have communion on his own two feet. It is power. It is healing. It is life. It is resurrection. It is real. It's not fake. It's not theory. It's not just something we talk about. Father John of Kronstadt used to say this when he's in the liturgy talking to the other priests he says where else is there anything to compare with what we have look there he is Christ here amidst us and says we're next to him like the apostles the same Jesus Christ that you read about in the gospel you watch on the chosen series like the Jesus Christ he's here and saying Father John's like can you believe it? There's nothing. We're right next to Him. Why isn't that more exciting? Just because your physical eyes don't see, but if we had spiritual eyes to see, would it make a difference? Everyone is in the altar when He's uh, praying, filled with fear as though the angels are hovering around them. They're like, oh. You know that Satan, we tell you, always make the sign of the cross. Because Satan trembles at the sign of the cross. All the monastic fathers, they did it. When they'd go and sleep in the desert, they would do the sign of the cross in circles. In the morning, they'd wake up, they'd find like dead serpents around because the cross. Satan is afraid of the sign of the cross. What about our Lord himself, who offered his body on the cross to defeat our worst enemy, death? That Jesus Christ... When he is inside of you, what do you think Satan is feeling when he's inside of you? If this scares him, what about Jesus Christ who defeated him on Calvary? Shouldn't that scare Satan? Absolutely. This should be our greatest weapon against Satan. And it makes sense. St. John Chrysostom said this about the liturgy. The Eucharist is a fire that inflames us like lions breathing fire, we may retire from the altar being made terrible to the devil. Could you imagine when you take the body and blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you, you are like a lion breathing fire that Satan is afraid of you. If you allow the divine power to be transmitted through you. But a lot of time our attitude is, yeah, I got in line and I, I, I had bread and some wine. And it doesn't do anything for you. I, I found this quote which I thought was nice. is Every time this mystery is celebrated, the work of our redemption is carried on. We break the one bread that provides the medicine of immortality, the antidote for death, and the food that makes us live forever in Jesus Christ. I have to ask you, 
Could your life change from the Eucharist? Absolutely. It's changed so many people. And the reason why it's not changing us is because of the Eucharistic crisis. Our perception is that it's just routine. No, this is the life-giving, healing, resurrected Jesus Christ, the most powerful, offering Himself to you. I want you to have that mentality when you come to church. Come expecting, come asking, come pleading. Even though I told you to come being thankful, come being grateful. That's what being Eucharistic is, is to be grateful, but also come anticipating. Like I said, if I said Jesus Christ was going to walk down Fairfield Ranch Road, you're like, ooh! But yet He gives you more. He doesn't want to walk among you. He wants to abide in you and you in Him. I have so much more to say about the Eucharist, which I won't do now. But God willing, in the next few weeks, I want us to change our minds and our lives centered around the Eucharist. So when you have the chance, come. When your kids say no, say, you don't understand how grateful we are for everything. We're going to give thanks. And I promise you, when you come to give God thanks, it's not like you're going to be outdoing Him. Because when you come to give thanks, what happens? You end up receiving more and more. You're like, why do I leave this church? Every time I come, He gives me more. I, gotta, I should just stay here because I should just say thank you all day at all times because He gives us. So come expecting that you're going to receive something amazing. Okay? Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I thank you, dear Lord, for your divine plans. I thank you for your divine providence. I thank you for your divine love, which desires to unite us sinners with you, not just to unite us to bring sinful to unite with the holy, but to change the sinful into the holy. I pray, dear Lord, that we would be filled. Help us, O oh Lord, I know that our physical eyes don't see, but our spiritual eyes open them. Help us, O oh Lord, to see your grace and your glory. Help us, O oh Lord, to be penetrated by you completely, our minds, our hearts, our eyes, our words, our hands, and our hearts, and our will. I pray, dear Lord, that the Eucharist crisis would no longer be a crisis, that we would perceive the amazing grace that's given to us. I thank you, dear Lord, in not only for uniting us here as one body, but in every Eucharistic prayer said throughout all time and in all places in your name. I thank you, dear Lord, for this gift. Help us, O oh Lord, to appreciate this heavenly gift. Bless us and accept our prayers when we cry unto you through the session of St. Mary and with the voices of all the beloved saints and all the angels who are dwelling with us right now when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So there is a request uh, for those of you that have a few minutes. Uh, Amba Sarabian is coming next week and maybe Amba Kroos and they're going to have the tables set up for him like in a U. So if anyone has time to help set up a few tables, we're going to try and set up now so that next Saturday when they pray they're...